<laughs> so, again, thanks for everyone for being here. Um, <clears throat> so, my talk today you know, really came out of me reflecting on you know, just what brought me to this state where I am right now, this lowly state. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, um, how did it, you know, what events, what conditions in my life, you know, generated somebody who would uh, start to study meditation and become a Buddhist and then progress on to ordination and such. So this is the story of me up to this point, you know, what led to this. Um, so in 1972, which I'm sure everyone can remember when 1970, okay, never mind. <laughs> I was 15 years old, and I, that year I suffered a really severe injury to my left leg. You know, and in a way, I owe, I owe everything to my left leg right now. Um, Back then, I used to ride my bike to school every day, and it was a long ride, like 12 miles. Ride my bike to school every day. And it was in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. And one day, I was riding my bike to school, and my leg, my bike and my leg met up with a semi-truck. So my left leg was crushed and uh, run, the bike wheel was run over by the semi-truck and uh, my leg obviously was injured in that. It was a, a bad crush fracture, basically. And what I remember from, from then, you know, for, for one thing, PTSD is real. <laughs> you know? I remember, you know, just not being able to hardly sleep for weeks after that, you know, and just reliving the whole thing. <clears throat> um, but in any case, that event was pivotal in my life, you know, not just because it was such a, you know, horrendous injury, but um, what I noticed as I was laying there, not on the pavement, but, you know, off on the side, a little bit of a um, dirt patch, People were gathered around me, looking down, uh, trying to console me and comfort me. Um, and honestly, I wasn't feeling pain at that point. I was, you know, as they say, in shock. Uh, some of the fortunate things besides these people comforting me, you know, stopping their, you know, what they had to do in order to, to help me, <coughs> was uh, there were police in the area. Uh, there was a police car right kind of sort of kitty corner to where this event happened. And they, you know, summoned um, the EMS, you know, the emergency services, and an ambulance arrived pretty quickly and got me to the hospital. And, and that's when things started to hurt, you know. I, I started to experience some pain. It was not nice. And um, in that situation, you know, I was uh, wheeled off to, to surgery. And for the next three weeks, I experienced, you know, trying to the, the doctors, uh, surgeons, and everybody figure out um, just how they're going to set my leg so that it would actually heal. You know, they first put pins in it to get the, the bone edges to close together. So if you don't know, when you fracture something, you know, the bones won't the, that fracture won't heal unless those edges of bone are real close together, okay? <clears throat> and they tried that with pins, and to no avail, did not work. So they had to take the pins out, um, and uh, reset set the leg in such a way that um, the edges were close together, but with no pins, which meant that I was going to have to bear weight on that, that leg. Um, and took that in stride, but, you know, I didn't know what I was in for, you know. <laughs> so all in all, you know, just every interaction that I had with the doctors and nurses and the therapists, you know, I felt their, their concern, their compassion, their, their desire and almost need to help me get better. And specifically, you know, I remember physical therapy. 
they had me walking with the, you know, the two bars, you know, the, the parallel bars, if you will, you know. And um, they just, you know, I stepped on it. I said, I can't do this. This, you know, this hurts. They said, you can, you can do it. Just, just, you know, keep putting pressure on Just do it. And man, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been to a physician or in the hospital and they ask you, what's your, what's your pain on a scale of zero to 10? Zero is nothing. You know, 10 is, um, you know, the worst pain that, you know, you could ever imagine. And being an RN, you know, I've known, known people that seem perfectly okay, and they say 10. <laughs> you, know, you know, that was my 10. You know, that's, if I had, you know, excruciating pain of bone on bone and trying to, to walk with it. But that worked. My leg healed, you know. And as a result of this, you know, you're asking, you know, how did that get me here? Well, this is how it got me here. Um, my leg was about an inch shorter now as a result of all that. Uh, and uh, my mom uh, filed a lawsuit against the, the trucking company. <coughs> and that money that was awarded helped, you know, not only pay for the, the doctor bills, but put me through college. You know, in, you know, 90% of, you know, and there was some money spent and, and uh, grants and such, but most of the money was the, that lawsuit money. <clears throat> and if it wasn't for going to college, oh, this winding road getting to where I'm going here, <clears throat> if it wasn't for going to, to college, I wouldn't have been exposed to different ideas and such, and I wouldn't have taken this one literature course called Literary Expressions of the Underground Movement, <clears throat> in which we um, emphasized uh, Zen Buddhism quite a bit for the first part of the class at least and read um, Zen Mind Beginner's Mind by Shunryu Suzuki Roshi and that text just if there's any one thing that kind of flipped me in this direction it was that so I owe being here to my left leg you know <laughs> so you know and you you know just consider you know what brought you to where you are today? You know, just, you know, it's, it's uh, contemplation, um, you know, analysis of life is in a, in a big way part of the, the Buddhist path, you know, to an analyze, you know, just what is, what is so? You know, why are we here? How did I get here? <clears throat> so I'm the, the beneficiary of the compassion of others, right? as we all are. Um, <clears throat> now this, if you've been around Buddhism long enough, you know that compassion is one of the running themes in, in Buddhism, basically. True? I think it's true. <clears throat> and compassion, there's a, so, um, Pali and Sanskrit words for this, but compassion is one of the sub four sublime states. Or, in um, Mahayana Buddhism, they speak of the four immeasurables. Um, and what are those? There's metta, these are the, the Pali words for this. Metta, karuna, mudita, and upekka. So those are the four immeasurables, the four sublime states. Metta being, <clears throat> the poor translation that we give it is um, loving kindness. But you know, the definition really is, you know, wanting happiness and wellness for others, you know, sincerely wanting others to be happy, you know. Karuna is, com you know, we define it, or, you know, substitute the word, English word, compassion for karuna. <clears throat> but compassion, if we look at it, it's that um, sense of, uh, of, of pity, of concern for somebody else's suffering. You know, I have compassion, you know, I have compassion for you. But karuna has the same root as karma. Karma, you know, strictly defined as action. So they both come from this root to act. <clears throat> so karuna, compassion, is, you know, not only wanting 
the, the suffering, you know, your suffering to stop, but I'm going to do something about it. You know, the, the intention to actually stop other suffering. You know, to actually get in the mud and, and physically, you know, wrestle with, with stopping suffering. Mudita is um, sympathetic joy, finding joy and happiness in other people's success. You know, if somebody, you know, wins the lottery, you don't say, ah, <laughs> you know, but, you know <clears throat> with enough study and, and commitment to the practice, you know, you're truly happy for that individual. You take joy in their, in their joy. And upeka, equanimity, <clears throat> and I think that word in, in itself is maybe a little weak compared to what upeka really means. You know, equanimity, if we look it up in the dictionary, is just being emotionally stable and composed, you know. <clears throat> not being, you know, influenced by um, um, good or bad uh, stimuli, if, if you will. But for in Buddhism, in Upeka, is not simply being that even-keeled individual, but um, having no preferences, you know, <clears throat> being able to look out at the world and having no favorites. Everybody, everything is treated equally, you know. Um, I struggled to find this definition or this word in the definition, but I couldn't find it. I guess it's not real. But for me, <clears throat> how about this, you know? having equal love for everybody and everything. You know, having that, that, that appreciation for everything and everybody. And, you know, no more for less, no, you know, that's pretty cool. <laughs> no less for, for less or no more for, for Brian, you know, so. <clears throat> but anyway, you understand. So, so compassion or karuna is this, wanting others to be free from suffering and having the intention and the, the willpower to do something about it. You know, we all have this drive to save others, I feel. You know, I've experienced it when I was injured, laying, you know, in the, on the dirt there, people gathering, the ambulance coming. <clears throat> they actually found the driver of the truck and he came and he apologized you know, profusely. He didn't know that he had done what he had done. You know, he didn't know the truck had run over me. <clears throat> so there's this compassion that we have, you know, <clears throat> that I think is like innate and built into us. And if you have some examples that you can think of is like, you know, 9-11. <clears throat> so the buildings fall, there's rubble and dust and, you know, thousands of people have been, have died and others who haven't been killed rush in to help you know that's karuna that's karuna you know, going through the rubble and digging people out earthquakes like the recent one in haiti you know people going through the rubble to find survivors to find <clears throat> what is left of people you know it's that compassion that we want to to save them from their suffering. Now, <clears throat> if you if you will, maybe put our hands in hop chong here for. So I'm just going to recite that first line from the Heart Sutra. The Bodhisattva of great compassion, from the deep practice of prajna paramita, perceive the emptiness of all five skandhas. <clears throat> Excuse me and delivered all beings from their suffering. And so ends that reading, if you will. So, great compassion, the bodhisattva of great compassion. Maha karuna, not just karuna, maha karuna. There are parts of our chanting when you hear, you know, maha sal, great bodhisattva, great being. You know, prajna paramita, the practice of prajna paramita, <clears throat> the practice of the perfection of wisdom. It's strictly what the, that word means. And he's perceived the emptiness of, the, of all five skandhas. And in the heart, as we were chanting it today, you know, given that I'm talking about this today, <clears throat> I was just marveling at how the, that sutra just covers all of these bases, if you, you know, 
that um, you know it is you know the d the description of an enlightenment or awakening if we could ever achieve such. So when we talk about the skandhas, you know you might wonder wonder. <clears throat> because these are some foreign words we're, we're using, you know, but we're chanting something in English, but we're using this um, Sanskrit word, skanda. It just simply means, you know, the English interpretation would be a heap or, a, or an aggregate. So what is that? You know, what are, what are the five skandhas? <clears throat> it is considered that which makes up a, a human, you know. You could even, you know, pass that on to other beings and animals, I, I would think. But specifically, we're talking about what makes a person. And the Heart Sutra recites those. You know, <clears throat> the Bodhisattva, great compassion, perceived the emptiness of all five skandhas and delivered all beings, you know, and perceived the emptiness of not only um, uh, of 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 rupa, your body, but you know also feeling, thought, impulse, and consciousness. All those things make make up you. <coughs> so let's test compassion for ourselves. Let's test it out. Suppose you're this is like a, a mind experiment, if you will. <coughs> Suppose you're a new college student. You've left home. You've gone to to school. To college. <clears throat> and you, you know, part of your um, the introductory classes and such, you know, you're um, going through all the the little um, seminars and whatnot that they give, and you come to the point where you're going to decide where you're going to live. You're going to live on campus or off campus. You said, "I'm going to live on campus. I'm going to live in a dorm. I want to experience the whole college thing, right?" <laughs> <coughs> so, <clears throat> unless you figured it out. A Ahead of time, you don't know who your roommate is going to be. You're going to you're going into this dorm, and I'll describe my first dorm room. You're in this dorm, and you've got a roommate, somebody you don't even know. You've never met this person f at all, but you um, come to meet them, and you feel, oh, we're on the same page. We're both freshmen. We both come from someplace other than here. <laughs> you know, so uh, this is you know you know we have some things in common at least. Um, and you come to your room, and there's it's a big room, you know, you know, decent size, but there's uh, one side has a bed, the other side has a bed, and there's a small bathroom, and that's your, that's where you're going to live for this next semester. And you think, well, geez, we're going to sleep in a sense together in a way, you know, it's like right there, you're over here, I'm over here, and. You fall asleep that night after unpacking and everything is, is, is um, put away. And your roommate is over there sleeping and you're sleeping. And come about one in the morning, you hear, help, help, help. And he's thrashing and he's, help me, help, help. And you're like, what do you do? He's having a nightmare. What do you do? What do you do? Don't you wake him up? You're like, wake up, wake up. You know, you're having a dream. You're dreaming. You know, that is your compassion coming to the to the forefront. You know, I suppose it's possible. <laughs> Just like wait it out for it to to go away and like not talk about it ever again or something. But I think really, you know, uh, a root reaction is to go over there and, and try to do something about it, to wake, that, to wake up your roommate. You know? So the kinds of suffering that we want to, to end, you know, suffering like that, you know, um, physical suffering, emotional suffering. If a baby is crying, the mom's natural instinct is to comfort that baby. <coughs> but the bodhisattva of great compassion, what suffering is he, she, after what is he trying to alleviate? What suffering is he trying to stop in the in the world? <coughs> Avalokiteshvara, Kwanseum uh, Bosal uh, in Korean, is 
the, the Bodhisattva a great compassion. <coughs> and um, it comes from an Avalokiteshvara, meaning one who hears the cries of the world. You know, you, you hear the, the suffering of the world and you uh, have this mission as a Bodhisattva to end this. Now, what suffering does this bodhisattva want to end? So he, he wants to end the suffering of human beings in samsara. You know, samsara, what is that? It's that endless cycle of birth and death, birth and death, birth and death, over and over again. <coughs> and I think, you know, maybe that, that endless cycle of being physically born and dying and, you know, that ending possibly. But I think more so even is that endless cycle of the birth and uh, of, of ignorance and delusion. So trying to end that, you know, getting you out of this dream state, you know, wake up, you're dreaming, here you are, you know. And if we remember from the Heart Sutra, he um, saw the emptiness of all five skandhas, <coughs> form, feeling, thought, impulse, and consciousness. So what is it that we're being freed from there, from attachment, from desire, from craving, okay? <coughs> they say that those five skandhas are the um, five skandhas of clinging, those things that we cling to you know, to, to hold on to, to as, a, as an ego, in a sense. You know, those things that we want to, that we hold on in order to, to feel that we're a human being, that we're a, an, an identity, that we have um, um, something that we can call I. So, can you imagine being free, as the Bodhisattva of Great Compassion wants you, being free from attachment to this body, no longer feeling in identified with this body. You know, you know you have a body, you know, you know there is a body, but you also know that it's not the, the essence of who you are necessarily. <coughs> Can you imagine being free from um, sensations, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral sensations? Not having to, you know, an addiction comes into this. You know, you love, you crave that sensation that comes along with intoxication. What if you could be completely free of any attachment to that sensation? You know, what if you could be completely free of of um, these pr the thoughts, in a sense? We identify with our thoughts a lot, <coughs> but at the root, or th thoughts are simply, you know, you look at there. I see that's a chair. You know, what makes that a, a, this thought that identifies things as what they are, identifies things as what they are. And if we could be somehow free of that identification, as small as that might seem, it's something that it's important. You're actually <coughs> losing your, um, the world's grip on you. And what if you could be free of the impulses and urges to act on your thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have this thought, and every time you have this thought is cheeseburger, <laughs> you know, and that's what, you know, it drives you. What if you could be free of the impulse to, to act on that, that thought? You can have it all day long, but that doesn't mean you are going to eat a cheeseburger. You could eat one, you could not eat one. You're not attached to it. And then there's consciousness. You're no longer attached to the consciousness that, uh, that, that is generated in your mind. <coughs> but what we're talking about here, too, is the consciousness that's generated by what you see, what you hear, what you smell, the consciousness that's generated by what you taste, the consciousness that's generated by um, touching or feeling what's in the body, and the consciousness that's generated by what's in your mind. I know I'm getting, you know, off the, you know, in the deep weeds sometimes in a, in a way with this stuff. <coughs> but this is what we're striving to be free from, you know. You know, you say, we say we want to awaken. We say we want to be free from suffering. 
this is what we're trying to be free from the suffering of, you know, the, the, the suffering that comes from the attachment of, from all of these five skandhas. Now, so, you know, this means becoming awakened. This means becoming a Buddha to, be, to get free of these things, at least to become awakened. And there's a Korean phrase that a, a lot of speakers end their Dharma talks with, and it's Songbul Hashipsho, which means, may you be enlightened. You know, may you become Buddha in this lifetime. And so, that's how I'm going to end my talk today, okay? So, for all of you, Songbul Hashipsho. Mm.